Hey friends, welcome to episode 463 of the My123 Cents podcast. Thank you for listening and or watching over at youtube.com slash my123 cents. I am your host, Kevin Huntsberger, and uh, we're talking Halloween. It is October 2nd as the show is dropping, and all month long, the plan is to have Halloween themed shows uh, involving the world of professional wrestling. And this week, uh, kicking it off with a Make Me Choose, I found a, a meme a while back it was uh, uh from the simpsons and it was make me choose between two wrestlers and i shared that and got a lot of feedback from it so i thought instead of just responding to this on social media i'm going to make this a podcast series so i've done it with tag teams and now uh, for the first monday in october we're doing it as a uh, a scariest wrestler make me choose between two scary wrestler editions so uh, got a lot of feedback too, a lot of input uh, over on the My One Two Three Cents Facebook page, and also the My One Two Three Cents Facebook group. So if you're not following on the uh, Facebook page and you haven't joined the group yet, please do so. Looking to build some interaction, some fun, and and, and have some activities going on there. We will get to the list in just a few minutes. So I have some uh, housekeeping to do here before we get to the bulk of the show, and that is also that. Uh, the My123 Cents Toy Drive is underway, and you can drop off a brand new wrestling figure or wrestling-related toy um, at the Castle Perilous in Carbondale, Illinois, or you can Venmo me. Uh, I'm going to be going out shopping. I've had a friend uh, Venmo me some, some money already. I've had a couple of people drop off toys here uh, at my house, so um, I'm willing to meet folks within a, a certain area of Southern Illinois, or you can simply mail uh, items to me as well. So just send me a uh, message on Facebook or, or Instagram or Twitter, wherever the case may be, and uh, uh, let's make Christmas brighter this year. The goal is 300. It's a lofty goal, and I really, really think that we can make it, uh, but we have some handicaps this year with losing uh, the Stride Pro Wrestling portion of this, so uh, it's it's just going to be my one, two, three cents this year, and I know that uh, we'll be able to make that happen. So we've already had some generosity and, and I have a feeling that that's going to carry on and continue. Of course, October though, we're thinking Halloween and candy and, and all that good stuff. So hopefully uh, though, while you're out and about maybe buying some Halloween candy or Halloween decorations, grab a wrestling figure while you're out to throw it in the cart um, and uh, it'll make a difference in someone's life this upcoming holiday season. If you don't know, that drive goes to uh, Toys for Tots here in Southern Illinois, which supports five counties in Southern Illinois. So again, any support uh, that you uh, want to give will be greatly appreciated. Um, Nerd United, Greg Mahochko and Mike Luther. Uh, it's another podcast here on the Jittery Monkey Podcasting Network. They also have a YouTube channel, so check that out as well. Um, I'm going to attempt to drop in a clip from their most recent show. They had me on as a guest. We were talking about uh, the Netflix series Wrestlers. Um, if you haven't watched it, and I'll give you a small spoiler of what I talk about over on the show, watch it. You know, that is uh, the bulk of our conversation. But we had a little fun to playing a game of uh, uh, blind ranking finishing maneuvers uh, for pro wrestlers. So Greg and... and uh, and Mike both picked and they kind of ping pong back and forth and threw out some finishers at me. So I'm gonna give you a small taste of what that interview was all about. I'm gonna okay. hit you from Chicago, the doomsday device. Ooh. Uh, man, one of the best tag team moves of all time. True. It's scary as hell, scary though, as if, if you don't uh, do it right. Um, I'm going to give this one a two. Okay, okay. By the way, see who's on the... It, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin. Does that look like that's Kurt Hennig on the receiving end of that? It looks like it, but I don't think it is. Okay. I, I don't remember them ever wrestling with Mr. Perfect in gotcha. the wwf but i could be wrong okay now i'm gonna go with one that might be your number one the 619 oh man i like See, how and that's the thing i don't know what else you guys have so exactly that's the point oh what are we we're down to what you, one or six you have one three or six 
Oh, okay. I'll, I'll give this the three. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm banking on something big for number one. And so, uh, again, check them out uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, but also here on the Jittery Monkey Podcasting Network. Be sure to like, subscribe, and let us know what you think of the podcast here on the network and what we're doing. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, I do want to get to the topic at hand, and that is scary wrestlers. Now, three years ago, it's hard to believe it's been that long ago already, but three years ago, I did a series, uh, uh, Scariest Wrestlers of All Time, uh, just in my opinion, on on my TikTok channel, and just kind of uh, threw out a wrestler and talked about him for or her for, uh, you know, about a minute or so. and, and uh, it, it, you know, three years later, there are still some of those videos that are, are getting some traction and people are liking and responding to them. So I thought I would put this out to the My One, Two, Three Sins universe, if you will, and uh, had people make me choose between two wrestlers. And I'm, I'm, I'm putting this criteria out. I've talked before about favorite versus best. And in this case, it's going to be kind of scariest. Uh, not necessarily these are competitors that are going to be in the ring with each other although i am going to kind of throw some of that commentary in but it's also just kind of that scare factor now granted as most of the wrestlers on this list um had scary gimmicks but i was either in high school or college or an adult when these these guys came around so being quote-unquote scared wasn't really a factor like I, I wasn't afraid of any of these particular wrestlers i mean obviously if they were coming after me in a dark alley i would be afraid but uh, so the scare factor is going to be kind of subjective um i don't have a rubric for that as my wife likes to always tell me to have a rubric for things when i'm ranking them but um really uh got a lot of great choices here and so i'm going to kind of walk through and talk through some of these um kind of some of them giving no thought to before i did this and some of them i looked at and thought instantly who i was going to pick so dalton anthony and hunter woodworth both picked bray wyatt you know the nxt version or the cult leader version of the wyatt family versus the fiend and uh, I, I think this is a great one to start off with because i think that in modern wrestling uh, most of us think of uh, the scary uh, or, uh, you know, the thriller type of characters, um, Bray Wyatt has to be at the top of the list. And I personally love both The Fiend and The Cult Leader. I also liked uh, The Firefly Funhouse. I loved The, Flyer, the Firefly Funhouse. Um, and of course, that was the alter ego for The Fiend. And you know, unfortunately, due to his passing uh, earlier this year, just a couple of months ago, or I don't even think it's been a couple of months yet, but uh, was reading some reports that he was supposed to come back this month in October, Bray Wyatt was. So it, it, it's still, it's it's hard to believe that he's gone and and so much potential there and, and what we could have seen carry on and continue with what we had started or what the WWE had started uh, earlier this year with uh, the fiend making that comeback um, and and wrestling Ellie Knight at at the Royal Rumble and then that whisper between he and the Undertaker you know what I, I I have to wonder and think would that have played into this reintroduction this fall of of Bray Wyatt um, but to give an answer I, I think the fiend at times was a little too hokey um, you know the burning stuff with Randy Orton a while back and. But I like what he was doing with Alexa Bliss, too. It, it's hard to pick a winner in this one, but I'm going to give it by a, a, a very small margin to the cult leader. Um, I loved the lantern. The He's got the whole world in his hands. The, the, it just, the, the Wyatt family itself, and, and we're going to get to that in a little bit as well. But um, yeah, I really think that that cult leader version of Bray Wyatt was amazing and and was a showcase you know being able to see the incarnations of the characters that he did uh not just the fiend and and uh bray wyatt but also as husky harris and so uh, again another uh, 
individual gone way too soon in the world of professional wrestling. Uh, but I want to thank Dalton. I want to thank everybody for their for their input here. Dalton also threw out Papa Shango versus the Boogeyman. Now, from a favorite standpoint, and I would even go the scare factor, I'm going to go with Papa Shango. I feel like when he debuted in 92, you know, I was uh, in college. I thought it was a little hokey, but it was good. I, it, it, I liked those kitschy kind of characters. And even back then, I, when I was watching, I liked it. I feel like though with Papa Shango, he kind of, I, I, I feel like in another time, he probably, you know, he, could you have imagined him as a, an eighties villain for Hulk Hogan? You know, he was, he had the size and he had the ability and he, he did have that scare factor. I mean, I can remember watching when, when he made the ultimate warrior vomit or had the, the ooze coming out of his head or, or, you know, when he was setting wrestlers feet on fire or whatever else he was doing to the enhancement talent. And the kids in the audience, they would pan the crowds. And, and these kids, little kids, were, were, you know, understandably scared. So uh, the Boogeyman, I, I, I never really connected with the Boogeyman. I thought that it was way silly. Um, and, but, you know, it, 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 the Boogeyman was more of something that I would have expected in the 80s or the early 90s in that Papa Shango era, not in 2006 or 2005 when we, when we saw the Boogeyman. But again... Talented man behind the gimmick. I, I thought that he worked it and, and did a great job with it, but I'm giving the edge there, of course, to uh, Papa Shango. Love Papa Shango. Um, here's a good one. Uh, Justin Gassage suggests Luna Vishan versus Bull Nakano. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Bull Nakano. I know that she had some time in WWE, as did Luna. Luna uh, first time I ever remember Luna was seeing her in... Uh, the after mags and she you know was managing a team called the black hearts and they wore these uh, white masks and wore black capes and hoods um i thought she was scary the tattoo down the face the shaped head the raspy voice um and she's actually one that i highlighted in the scariest wrestlers over on tiktok so uh love luna vachon and i'm going to give her the edge in this one but david fetter throws out Luna Vachon versus Scary Sherry. Now, I think Scary Sherry kind of got a bad rap. You know, she was called Scary Sherry when she was with the Macho King and, and wore all the makeup. Um, but I loved Sherry, you know, whether it was when she was with Shawn Michaels or Ted DiBiase or uh, with the Macho King. I, best version of her, I think, was with the Macho King. Um, but then, you know, an accomplished wrestler just like Luna, you know, but... Uh, uh, former AWA women's champion, former WWF women's champion, um, went on to manage Harlem Heat in WCW. Uh, Ric Flair, she was with him for, for a little bit. You know, Sherry's in my top probably five, definitely top five of, of managed, favorite managers. I I've just felt like she brought something to the table that uh, not a lot of other female talent did back in that era. Uh, she had the ability to wrestle, but she could also talk. And she could adapt and change characters, whether it was with Sean or with Randy Savage or with Harlem Heat. She was able to adapt to the guy that she was managing, that she was seconding. Luna always still kind of had that gruff, rough uh, exterior. And another great talent, both these ladies gone way too soon. And, and Luna certainly belongs in that WWE Hall of Fame. And hopefully one day that happens. But I'm going to give the edge in this one to sensational sherry or scary sherry in in this case uh mike luther mentioned him a few minutes ago on the nerd united podcast he says sting versus mankind this is an interesting one because you know in the early 90s we had sting surfer sting my favorite incarnation of sting by the way versus cactus jack and we saw that sting dominated that feud in terms of wins in the ring but i wonder with surfers i'm sorry with crow sting which is this is what I'm assuming Mike is talking about versus Mankind. It's a different dynamic. And Mankind went on to become such a big part of the Attitude Era. And of course, Sting, as Crow Sting, was a big part of the Nitro Era, the, the Monday Night War Era. Be a hell of a contest, a hell of a contest. But if I'm going with favorites here, I like Sting a lot, but I, I liked Surfer Sting much more. And I liked Mankind or like Mankind more as well. So I'm going to give Mankind the very slight edge in this one as well. Now, I think that Sting, uh, talent-wise, in the ring, if they had a match, 
I would probably give the edge to Sting, a slight edge, but Mankind, um, I just think that he, uh, the character, you know, in, in 96 when he first came in and was pulling out his hair and had the pet rat and the music, the, you know, the, the it, it was, you know, not that he was Lex Luger, but he was the total package and another great talker and one of those all around great talents uh, in the world of professional wrestling. Brian Juvers, who was a guest on this podcast a couple of years ago, we talked about LJN figures. Uh, he throws out Kevin Sullivan versus Doink the Clown. Now, I can tell you from an evil or scary standpoint, that 1970s and, and early 80s version of Kevin Sullivan in Florida uh, was hard to beat. You know, there are people that still to this day believe that he is satanic, that he uh, had had was doing the work of the devil um, and Doink the Clown. You know, early Doink, you know, 93, when he, 92, 93, when he comes into the WWF and as Matt Bourne and, and kind of that evil clown, I, I think that that's still one of my all-time favorite gimmicks. You know, I, I probably, honestly, if I sat here and thought about it, and I'll probably do a, a six cents on this down the road, um, but I, I think Doink would definitely be on there as favorite gimmicks goes. Um, so as far as my favorite, I got to give it to Doink. Um, even if there were a match, I would give it to Doink. But that scare factor definitely goes to Kevin Sullivan. You know, when he was managing the Dungeon of Doom and, and, and that era of WCW, it became a little hokey. But I'm going with that 70s and 80s, early 80s Kevin Sullivan, man. Not many uh, talent out there scarier and, and more devious than that. Bryce Edwards throws out Abyss versus Raven. Now, I think these two may have wrestled in TNA. I don't know that for sure. Um, Abyss is someone that I have met. He was part of a, a Stride Pro Wrestling show in Pinckneyville, Illinois, years back. Um, nice guy. I, I don't know if, you know, behind, you know, and I, I think that they've talked about Joseph Park enough or Chris Park enough. Uh, that we know that, you know, the man behind the mask, so to speak, is is not necessarily as as evil and, and nasty as, as we may think. Um, I liked Abyss, um, uh, you know, the character. I, I know that some argued that it was a Kane and Mankind ripoff. Uh, and with the look, maybe I could see where people would, would pick up on that. Um, but I do think he did a good job of kind of creating his own niche and creating his own identity and brand in TNA. Now, uh, he is obviously behind the scenes and not wrestling anymore. Raven, uh, you know, Raven was great too. And, and, but I liked Scotty Flamingo and I liked Johnny Polo. Um, so I think that Scott Levy, the, the, the man behind all these characters makes things work as well. It's going to be another close one. And I think it depends if this becomes a stipulation match, I'm going to give the edge to Abyss, but if it's a straight up match, I'd give it to Raven. The scare factor, I'm going to go with Abyss, though, on that as well. Uh, we have Tyler Adams, who throws out The Undertaker and Mankind. And I just talked about Mankind very glowingly a few minutes ago. Um, the Undertaker, you know, these two, I think Mankind may be The Undertaker's greatest rival um, during those WWF days, WWE days. Uh, you know, the Hell in a Cell, notwithstanding, but the matches that led up before that, the matches that happened after that, I just feel like those two were great rivals. Um, scare factor, you know, The Undertaker went through those phases and incarnations where he was, uh, you know, that that scary dead man, the zombie, if you will, and he was coming and, and getting his opponents. And Mankind, though, had that fear factor going as well, and it worked for him. I'm going to give the edge, though, to The Undertaker, especially if we're talking, uh, you know, doing matches here. And I know that we're not necessarily pitting them in matches, but the, the scare factors. And I think that early Undertaker, um, and we're going to talk more about early Undertaker here in just a second, uh, I think that he really kind of gets that edge. So if you think 1990, 91 Undertaker, when he's still a heel and he's with Brother Love briefly and then Paul Bearer comes in versus Mankind when he first comes in, one, that would have been a great tag team, I think. But uh, I think that they would have had some some great matches, too. They had great matches a little later in, in their careers. But I think that uh, that was really good stuff there. Uh, Scott Cross, uh, as I said, uh, early Undertaker. He talks about uh, early 
1990-91 Undertaker versus Papa Shango. Now we know that Undertaker and Papa Shango did cross paths briefly uh, in WWF uh, back in the day. And then of course, behind the scenes, we know they're they're pretty cool with each other. But um, I, I would give the edge to the Undertaker as far as the scare factor and the, um, the, the wrestling factor. Uh, you know, Papa Shango was was scary to kids, I think, in, in kind of a hokey way. The Undertaker was this big intimidating presence um, of his opponents and the fans. And so I think when we throw that scare factor in, and then you factor in the urn and the body bags, you know, when he was beating his opponents, putting them in the body bags, that's another intimidation factor that really uh, went a long way and added to that scare factor with The Undertaker just reading my list to make sure that I haven't left anyone off. And I've got a few more here. Zachary Stan throws out uh, the boogeyman again here and Bray Wyatt. This one, I mean, hands down, it's Bray Wyatt all day. I, you know, Bray Wyatt, if I was doing, this is a sixth sense, Bray Wyatt would definitely be on that top list. If I was doing a Mount Rushmore, Bray Wyatt would be on the Mount Rushmore of scary wrestlers. Again, that psychological mind game that he played, the things that he did with John Cena, both at WrestleMania 30, and then again during the COVID WrestleMania, and I forget what number it was, but when they did that cinematic match, I just think that when he had that freedom to express himself and, and be that that color red, you know, in a black and white world, I'm the color red was paraphrasing what he said, but I just think that Bray Wyatt was just so incredibly talented. And, and you know, the boogeyman again, kind of that hokiness and that silliness factor, you know, eating the worms, uh, kudos to him for doing that and, and going up, you know, with that fear factor, if you will. But uh, I'm going to give the edge to uh, Bray Wyatt on that one. He also, Zach throws out uh, Luke Harper versus uh, Eric Rowan, who were both, of course, members of the Wyatt family and then tag team partners in the Bludgeon Brothers duo. Uh, Luke Harper, man, all day. And, and, you know, I feel like Luke Harper, I remember seeing him as Brody Lee when he was in Chikara. Chad had introduced me to Chikara and, uh, you know, so because he looked so much like Bruiser Brody, and of course I get the Brody Lee moniker, but he had uh, kind of those crazy eyes. I feel like he always had those crazy eyes and that big, bushy, unkempt beard, the crazy hair. To me, those were the things that made him stand out and, and made him scary because you didn't know exactly what he was capable of because you didn't know what he was thinking. And that fear factor kicks in when you don't know exactly what the big man is thinking and, and what he could do to someone. Eric Rowan, though, you know, kudos to him. I know that he tried a couple of different things in, in WWE, uh, had that pet tarantula in the big box, and I, I feel like WWE kind of dropped the ball uh, with him, but uh, I think that he's another uh, great talent out there and was a great member of, of the Wyatt family. Bull Bronson throws out the missing link versus the Yeti, as Tony Schiavone would say. The Yeti to me was just plain silly. I I'm not even sure how much after that Halloween Havoc in 95 that we actually saw the Yeti. One, I never understood the name because he was wrapped in, in toilet paper or what looked like toilet paper. So he looked like a giant mummy. So I don't get the Yeti reference. The missing link, though, I first saw him. Pardon my dogs if you hear them barking in the background. I apologize for that. But missing link, I uh, remember him from those early days in world class, when I, my early days of my fandom, that is. Uh, green face paint, crazy hair again. That crazy look, he was built, he had a great physique. Um, when he was part of Devastation Incorporated, of course, with Skandar Akbar and had that unpredictability factor. And I remember him feuding with the Von Erics at one point and Iceman Parsons and, and wrestling all the baby faces before he eventually turned face two. But he went to the WWF for a cup of coffee and, and kind of floundered and flopped. And uh, it was an example to me of, you know, what was working in that small smaller audience of, of world class just didn't translate over to the World Wrestling Federation and in an era when it probably could have and should have. But I think pairing him, WWF didn't have the right manager with him, I think. You know, Bobby Heenan, I love Bobby Heenan, and I love Jimmy Hart, but I don't think they were the right fit for a guy like The Missing Link. You know, he had Skandar Akbar in world class. I think Mr. Fuji probably would have been a more logical uh, choice of manager for The Missing Link. 
Um, but for whatever reason, it didn't work out. But uh, in this instance, it definitely would give the edge to the missing link, both wrestling wise and scare factor. Um, again, one of those guys that I really just enjoyed seeing in the ring. Uh, Dan Corley throws out Kane versus Gangrel. Um, you know, I think I talked about this a couple, was it last year, the year before last was the, uh, I think it was last year was the 25 year anniversary of Kane's debut. Uh, actually this week, this upcoming week is the 26 year anniversary, I guess, of Kane's debut at, uh, at Bad Blood in St. Louis. I was there for that. Um, and it, it's one of those all time great debuts. I think it, it's gotta be up there. And I remember, you know, the way that they would turn down the lights and it would be red and then he would, do, you know, drop his arms and the flames would shoot up. Great elements to this. And, and I remember, I still remember this 26 years later when I was an adult, I was married um, at the time, but I can remember having a dream where I was in the ring of wrestling. This was long before stride or before I had done any ring announcing, I'd done anything really with wrestling. Um, and Kane was coming out and I remember being so scared in this dream. Uh, and I woke up before he got to the ring, but for that alone, I got to give the fear factor to Kane in that instance. I've never had nightmares about any other wrestler, uh, before or since then. So definitely going to give Kane the edge, but Gangrel, you know, how can you deny him with the presentation, the blood, uh, when he was with the brood, I thought that, that was a really great faction in WWF at the time. And so I definitely would give him um, uh, a lot of kudos and, and the presentation factor. And I know he's still training and working and putting uh, guys out there uh, to this day. Um, I wanted to throw David Fetter back in here. I, I forgot when he threw Scary Sherry and, and Luna, he also had a, a male version of uh, uh Papa Shango versus Kevin Sullivan. And um, again, I, I think that, that Kevin Sullivan, that 70s and 80s version of him, definitely had the fear factor. Now, if we're talking Dungeon of Doom, Kevin Sullivan, then I would probably go and give the edge to uh, Papa Shango as far as uh, the fear factor. But uh, it would be a great match, I think, too, between those two. But I, I do, uh, I like... Papa Shango better and, and found him more entertaining. I, I, I wasn't watching wrestling when Kevin Sullivan was at the height of his, um, uh, you know, career when he was in the seventies in Florida in the eighties feuding with dusty roads. And I would see pictures in the mag, you know, in the seventies, I wasn't watching wrestling at all, but in the early eighties, I was seeing him in the magazines. I was not seeing him in the ring. And really by the time he came in, to the NWA and was uh, managing the varsity club. And, and that's, that's kind of my first time remembering seeing him on TV versus seeing him in those magazines with the face paint and the chains and, and the devil stuff and, and the Satanism perceived Satanism. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think that uh, that would be another great one. Um, and I'm saving the best for last, the one that made me chuckle the most, and that is Ken Johnson, who threw out Kevin Cheeseburger versus Nia Jax. That would be a nightmare. That would be another nightmare. We'll, we'll do a throwback to Kane here. That would end up being a nightmare. But uh, uh, yeah, Nia, definitely scarier than me. I am not intimidating at all, especially uh, in the wrestling ring. So I j just checking again, everybody is accounted for. I want to thank everyone who participated, asked, uh, or threw out a scenario for this week's episode. If you have other future make me choose ideas, let me know. If you have Halloween ideas uh, for this month, I have a couple that I'm going to do and, and try to get a couple of uh, uh, interviews set up and lined up this month as well. So it's a busy month ahead, but uh, we like it that way around here. So I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you so much for joining us this first week of October 2023 for the My One Two Three Cents podcast on the Jury Monkey Podcasting Network. I am Kevin Hunsperger. Have a great week, and we will talk again soon.